that so is that part of the reason we're also kind of upset like in our in this society currently as it sits we're so obsessed with like uh, superhero movies and uh, comic book movies and stuff because it's very uh, kind of black and white or there's some gray in the center but it's generally speaking kind of very black and white that's not necessarily the reason for the cultural fascination most of it has to do with the idea of superheroes representing different divine powers that you all possess hmm. so many of you see what superheroes do and you recognize in different ways you possess the same capability and that's why many individuals are drawn to them. There are certain dynamics, of course, of hero versus villain energies that draw people in. But the real crux of why that's so attractive fundamentally is because you're seeing different powers of consciousness expressed literally through the endeavors of the different superheroes portrayed in your films. So what kind of so as far as speaking of superheroes, so what is um, archetypically speaking, what is. Um, like Iron Man for represent in, in, as our archetype? It has to do with the idea of utilizing science and technology to create positive change and to allow for yourselves to really explore in ways that you would describe as being unlimited in nature. So using technology to transcend, which you would call physical limitations, using technology to open up and awaken different types of abilities that would otherwise be dormant. In okay. terms of the foundations of what you call Iron Man. Now, understand Iron Man also has many other qualities associated to him as a character. So it depends on also the version of Iron Man you're talking about. The Iron Man egregore connected to the comics, for example, will be different than the egregore of Iron Man portrayed within the film, such as the Avengers. Yeah. Or um, there are also elements within that more human dimension of Iron Man that are also attractive to different people and represent archetypes as well. What would So what would um, the Captain America archetype be as far as that superhero, Steve Rogers? It has to do with the idea of the archetype of the protector, the archetype of the defender in okay. general. That's one of the reasons why the item Captain America utilizes is the shield. So what would Hulk represent as an archetype? It has to do with the idea of what you would consider to be the wild man. Okay. The wild mm -hmm. man whom is able to utilize strength and power to create change, whom also still has a dimension of humanity within them. Therefore, the wild man can still act in ways that are ethical and represent working for the highest good of all. So that's still there. And even in some of your ancient stories of wild men, there are stories of these characters being terrible, being very disruptive, but then they will have a moment within their character evolution where they do something that surprises everyone, where they operate in a way that represents goodness and virtue. So the wild man archetype is very much connected to what you would describe as the Hulk. What would be the archetype of Thor that we see in, in the movies? The idea of the demigod. Okay. A person whom is part God, part man, whom is able to live amongst humans, relate to humans, but also is able to ascend into higher realms to have experiences most people could not possibly even imagine. Well, and I know Loki's the trickster god, yada, yada, yada. So that's that's pretty clear on that one. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think. I'm going through my list in my head of what I... Um, so kind of what will as you currently read it right now kind of going topical on this one um what will be as you read the energy right now what will be kind of the outcome of the conflict that is happening in ukraine depends what you do now yeah depends what you do now there's many different possible outcomes we're not going to make a prediction in that way yeah. because that situation is still crystallizing it's not fully settled in yet so even though it looks like an objective thing is happening that's just how it's being portrayed in actuality the patterns that are making it up have not yet densified they're still in flux they're still moving around they're still shifting taking their cues based off of all of you so it depends on how all of you feed energy into that situation feeding well, fear and conflict and judgment into that situation will only produce outcomes that are of those qualities. 
projecting peace and love and acceptance and joy and safety and happiness into that situation will produce outcomes that are connected to those qualities. So it depends on what you do. Now, when we say you, we're not just talking about your civilization. We're talking about you, specifically yeah, no, you, because I, I, as you know, all experiences are generated by you. So we're referring to you here. Yeah, I've been- You uh, determine what happens. Well, the, fir the first couple of days I was in kind of a more of a fear state and then I remembered a lot of what you've taught and what the Bashar has taught and like other various teachers that I've, I've listened to. And I more went into more of a neutral state about the whole experience. And I've been just more observing and less being in a fear state about the whole situation. All right. And that's helping. That's assisting. Yeah. No, I've been, um, I know as we all send and raise our vibration and our frequency to a higher, higher level, these sort of things will go away as a as a whole yes, um yes. is the window of context still set towards the end of 2023 or is that constantly in, sh in like shifting it's shifting in many ways it's likely you will begin to experience deeper phenomenons of contact within about five years based off our assessments. It depends on what you do. It depends really on how you use this year. This year is a powerful determining year for many different things. So if the momentums we're observing continue, it's likely within five years, you will have a much deeper relationship as a people to which you call open contact. So it's accelerating much more quickly than anticipated, oh, which is very, very cool. exciting for us. That's very, that's very cool. Um, in what ways would it be advantageous or in the version of earth that's already starting to have open contact with uh, the greater federation and everything um what way have they transformed their energy systems as they have done work on the planetary chakras in a way that has shifted the qualities of collective consciousness in a manner that is auspicious not just for open contact but global awakening and ascension they have also purged themselves personally of energies of what you would call negativity and negative limitation. So individuals have chosen to release these things that are in a sense holding them back and they have chosen to bless their planet, their communities, their families, one another, the world. So it starts as a snowball. A few people really commit and begin to do this. More people join them and that makes it easier for everyone to get on board whether they're conscious of it or not. So those are the things we have noticed on those versions of Earth where contact is happening. Because if you do not achieve those things, you will not be a vibrational match for contact. Because if you see others in your reality as being perhaps lesser than, if you see others in your reality as being something other than the divine, then how could you possibly accept extraterrestrials? They are, in a sense, the ultimate other. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one thing that's important. And if you see your earth as a negative, destructive place and you treat it as such, how could you ever interact positively with beings from other worlds if you judge your own world as some type of sinful and fallen place? No. So blessing your world presenting positive loving energies to the major centers of your world says vibrationally that you are ready to receive beings from other worlds. So all of these things must of course first come from within because if you judge your own inner world, how could you ever bless the outer world? If you judge your own inner self, how could you bless the other selves that you see? So it starts with you from you, that energy builds and it expands to the earth level. And from the earth level, it then expands into what you would call the cosmic level. That's that's pretty much what I thought, but I just wanted to kind of have that confirmation. Yes. Well, congratulations. You um, the money. Follow that train. Um, or better yet, get on board that train. Oh, I'm already on the train. I'm just, I, it's, um, humility has been one of the hardest lessons to actually Yes. Because I do you get I, something out of being prideful? Um, it was mostly def a defensive mechanism because of the way I the family I incarnated into was more on the abusive see. side of things. So it yes, was this is very common. Yes. Yeah. It's where many of you feel inspired to generate pride. Yeah. We understand. 
And we applaud you for learning to let that go because it really is dead weight and all it does is create division. It was a very so, powerful, it was a very powerful lesson that I transmuted from, it took me a very, well, it took me a, many years to do, but I was able to finally do it. As a, Would you like to know a secret? Yes. You're not done. Oh, Don't I'm, assume <laughs> you're finished with these things because the moment you assume you're finished with them is the moment that they unconsciously begin to project in your reality. So be yep. aware of that. Do not assume you have fully resolved something. It's a theme. Yes. Allow for yourself to stay open to all perspectives. So that way, if that thing is popping up in another area, you'll be able to see it. But if you say to yourself, oh no, I've already resolved it. And then it pops up in an area, you may actually repress or deny what you see. And yeah. that will create a karmic buildup, you could say, where eventually you'll have to process that energy, but it will be bigger due to the repression. So do not assume it's been resolved. Simply allow for yourself to live in the moment, free of narrative, free of story, completely. Let go of this idea of, oh, I'm a person who has overcome this. I'm a person who's done that. That's all your ego. And the moment you begin to align with that fantasy of a self, is the moment that you begin to then create separation between yourself and the world around you. Simply be in the moment, be in a positive state. Let the egoic stories go. They really don't serve you. They just hold you back. Many of you hold on to the egoic stories because you're terrified of the next level. The next level represents the bigger self, the higher self. The higher self's not going to hold on to a story over time. The higher self creates stories and meanings moment to moment to moment to moment to moment that are relevant for what's occurring in the moment. That's the main difference. The ego will create a story that it tries to hold on to over years. The higher self will create a story in the moment so it can perform a certain function in the moment and then it lets it go. And a new story is then generated without even having to really think about it. The story is generated based off of pure observation of what is. Okay. Now I, 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 I have a basic understanding of what you're saying and I, I know it will more unfold as I, as I go yeah. along. Yeah. Yes. We thank you for receiving it. And of yeah. course you have the recording here if you need to review any of the material. Absolutely. Um, switching to the next topic. Um, so I work as a massage therapist doing healing work at, at, work, at a physical rehabilitation clinic. All right. Um, how do I, I, I already essentially know how to manipulate energy and like put out a frequency and all those sort of things. What is, um, what is a way I can amplify the energy I put out to have a greater healing effect within the people that I work on? Using your breath and using visualization. These are the key ways. If you're just picturing it, you're not really channeling in external energy. You end up just utilizing your own. So it's important to make sure you're breathing in and you're channeling energy through you. So use your breath, inhale, taking the chi in, exhaling, sending it into the person. The idea is to also incorporate color frequencies into this. So see the energy as streams of color moving through you. Blend those two things and you will find that a great deal of amplification will then take place. If you bring the tip of your tongue to the roof of the mouth, this will also expand your aura. It will open your heart, allowing for more energies to be able to then access your frequency field so you can then channel greater levels of energy through you. Also make sure your posture is appropriate because if you are in poor posture, this will also obstruct the energy flow. So learning different martial arts, postures such as horse stance, something like this, can be useful while doing the massage therapy because the horse stance, which involves tucking the tailbone and the sacrum in, will flatten the idea of the lumbar curve, thus allowing for a bridge of energy to be present within the low back so energies can move through you more smoothly. Making sure your head posture is also appropriate so your head's not too forward will also be ideal because as you know, if the head's too far forward, this will alter the cervical spine structure, which will also limit the quality of energy flow. So alignment, structural alignment here is also 
important. Making sure you're channeling energy from a state of love and appreciation is also important because if you are in a state of stress and then you go channeling energy, you're just going to channel your stress into the person. So <laughs> consciously cultivate love, appreciation, gratitude, stay in that state to the best of your ability. And that will be the quality of the energy that is then channeled forth. Okay. Um, speaking of alignment and stuff. Um, so I got into porn when I was young and it kind of messed up my ability to fully be intimate with a partner. All right. Um, what is something I could, and I, I've more or less, I occasionally look at it, but I, I, I'm not perfect about it. All right. Um, what is, what is something that I could do to help rebalance that, sh that chakra so I could actually um, be more fully intimate with a partner, we'll say? Well, the first thing we would say is detox yourself of the energy from the pornography that you have accumulated. Because when you're watching porn, there's a lot going on there. Yeah. Number one, if you're masturbating to the porn, you're merging your sexual energy with the energies of the performers. So that means the trauma, that means the negative energy, and oftentimes the abuse that's a part of that industry are qualities you're marrying, you're sexually merging yourself with those things. If you orgasm during it, it's even stronger of a link. So those things are qualities you're taking on detoxify yourself from them learn different energetic detoxification techniques to get those attitudes perspectives and traumas that are a part of that industry out of you so what what would be a way of detoxifying that energetically there is a video on the channel's youtube page titled ryok over soul observation letting go we would encourage that you use that technique we'll save you the time just watch the video yeah, no, I'm, I'll, I'll go back and, watch and the more. idea is Whenever you're doing the exhale, and when you see the technique, you'll understand this. Whenever you exhale the black smoke out of your body, put into that black smoke all imprints, all frequencies of karma that are connected to the pornography. Do that daily for as many times as you can do, and you will make leaps and bounds in your evolution and in your ability to sexually and intimately and sensually relate to yourself and others just give me a minute i'm kind of like thing came up i'm like <laughs> that's uh, all right. yeah no I, I i know i'm just like because <laughs> this is something that's kind of plagued me for a while and i it's yeah something that will not plague but it's something that's challenged me for a while to be able to like right. you may you may take a moment we're here with you that's totally fine uh, on a oversoul level, because I know that's where you're actually really communicating with me on. Um, why did I take on that specifically as a challenge or a theme? Specifically so you could learn the art of intimacy through contrast. Because the pornography creates the idea of an artificial intimacy. It's not a real one. And it's actually a type of vampiric, you could say, dynamic. You feel like you're getting intimacy, but really you're giving your life force away to that industry. That's why it's such a powerful industry. It's vampiric in nature. Now, we're not saying all porn is vampiric, but most of it is. Most of it's designed to be. So through going through that experience of experiencing false intimacy and unhealthy power dynamics, such as vampirism, you're able to then understand through the contrast what true intimacy is, what true healthy dynamics are like, which involve power sharing as opposed to power hoarding or power siphoning. So through contrast, you're educating yourself on true intimacy. That's why many people choose that as a theme. And this has to do with the idea of in particular, different generational imprints that have existed within masculine consciousness, which is more visually oriented, and as a result is prone to objectification because of its visual orientation. So many men have inherited the idea of generational imprints that involve objectifying women, objectifying sex, 
objectifying partners. And as a result, that energy seeks to express itself through the path of least resistance. And because of how accessible pornography is, that ends up becoming the path of least resistance. It's even more accessible for some of you than physical partners at times. So that's why it seems to be such a thing that people gravitate to because it represents the path of least resistance for those, you could say, karmic energies that have been inherited to then play themselves out. But through realizing that it's a false intimacy, through realizing that it's actually based in unhealthy power dynamics, you can let go of that. And you can let go of the karmic imprints or whatever you want to call them that engender those types of behaviors. And through letting those things go, you will then be in a positive, loving state to then receive an actual partner in your physical reality who shares your values, who is equal to you on your evolutionary path, and whom is here to support and love you as you are for them. That's where this is designed to lead you all. If you remain conscious during the process and don't get swept away by the unconscious momentum that that industry creates and that you create through your relationship to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I, I have a partner that I can see myself building a life with. And it's just, um, I, I don't want to lose them because I can't become part of that. I can't fully express myself in that way. Well, you have some tools now to detoxify those things. And one of the things we'll say is as you get more in touch with that inner self and develop that loving relationship with the inner self, the easier it will be for you to then share that with your partner. You'll be able to go deeper with them. The level of depth you experience with them is a mirror reflection of the amount of depth you allow for yourself to experience with you. So as you nurture that inner quality, you will be able to go deeper with your partner. <sighs> Spiritual work is fun. <laughs> and sometimes it is work. It, yeah, it, you can't. And that's all right. That's all right. It's just like working out. Truly, yeah. it's just like working out. Sometimes it feels like the weight is going to crush you, but you have a spotter, your higher self behind you to help you lift it up. All you have to do is ask. You have the phrase, ask and you shall receive. That phrase applies to all situations. Whenever you need assistance, just ask. Just put it out there. If you don't ask, you will have to, in a sense, go it alone. But as soon as you ask for assistance, it's given instantly. So to assist you in your practicing of humility, whenever it feels like it's getting heavy, ask for help. You can also practice asking for help when things are easy, just to get you into the pattern of asking for help and using that divine assistance to enrich all experiences that you're having. Okay. Um, going to another thing from the oversoul level, why did it, uh, this has been kind of a recurring theme in my life where even when I have asked for assistance or I've asked very direct questions to people, it may be that I'm just not asking very clear questions more. Um, why does it always seem like I have to drag information out of people instead of it just flowing to me freely? Or well, having There's a few things here. The first thing we'll say is a message of clarification. When we mentioned ask for assistance, yeah. we're not necessarily referring about asking other people. Yeah, you can. We're specifically referring to invoking divinity, invoking the higher self, invoking your spirit guides, asking these dimensions of spirit for assistance. That's specifically what we were asked for one moment. That is specifically what we were saying yeah. in relationship to this situation, though. Sometimes it has to do with the idea of you attempting to access information you don't really need. Therefore, there's a great deal of resistance to that information flow, being able to reach you through that person, because perhaps they're not the most appropriate conduit for the information, number one. Perhaps you don't actually need that information, number two. These are the two major things. And the third one simply may be that they are insecure, perhaps, in relationship to their ability to clearly express themselves. Yes. Perhaps they are insecure about 
what they feel you may do when you have the information. So there may be certain egoic resistances there. Those are the three major things that we are detecting contribute to why you're experiencing some of those issues. Okay, uh, that's clarification more what I was, thank you for the clarification. You're welcome. Um, and then still along that same theme, um, is this, this is um, more from like the idea of kind of a karmic level where I was more of the antagonist in other, or I'm connected to antagonists in other incarnations where people this time around seem to view me as an enemy, even though I just try to be nice to everyone and be friendly with everyone. One of the things that they are detecting has to do with the idea of energies that have been repressed within you. They are able to sense that. They're able to feel that a little bit. Yeah. So that, to some, when they experience you, can translate as you being an enemy. Specifically because if you have repressed different dimensions of yourself, it's almost like you have, and we say this lovingly, abused yourself in a certain way. It's almost as if you are treating your inner self as an enemy. Therefore, you have pushed it away. You have bound it into a tight space like a cage. So people, when they see you, sometimes pick up on that. And they say, oh, this person will probably try to do the same to me. Even if you don't do that, even if you have no intention of doing that, that's how that can come off sometimes. So just get in touch with the idea of your inner self. Make sure you're not vilifying yourself or different things that exist within yourself. Make sure you're not repressing yourself or stuffing yourself or dimensions of yourself into tiny boxes or cages. Set those things free if they are there. Liberate them and you will find people treat you differently. Okay. I, I, I'm going to have to probably go back over this a couple of times before I kind of get the the larger aspect of what you're, yes. what you're conveying to me. Yes, um, we're just saying that if you treat yourself or dimensions of yourself as an enemy, then that will be subtly projected into your field. And then when people see you, because you are perhaps seeing yourself or dimensions of yourself as an enemy, people will then detect that and may begin to see you as an enemy because that's what you are subtly broadcasting. That's what but, we're saying. So is that also part of the reason my dog acts as a way of he's protecting himself because he's a reflection of what I'm hiding in, or the there's dimensions of this present. Yes. Yes. Your assessment is accurate. There's okay. more to it, but that is an accurate assessment. Yes. Yeah, no, the, the, this is, I've, I've, I've had to work on him for a while it's where he just, he doesn't completely flip out on other dogs and it's like, um, and there you have it. Well done. Well done using your intuition in that way. Listening to the Bashar for a bunch of years, it's I've been able to pick apart a lot of things that I would have never been able to pick had I not listened to that information. Um, going for more of a little bit of a different kind of question, what's your favorite part of your of, um, Esasani? Like, well, there are many dimensions to our experience that are quite enjoyable. In terms of favorites, existing itself is our favorite part because yeah. it's the only part. Well, yeah. So that's our fundamental favorite. Now, there are certain things that I engage in that, to me, represent dimensions of my passion, dimensions of my destiny expressed. And for me, that represents the idea of peering into different worlds, peering into different civilizations and making contact with individuals there whom are sensitive to my energy, such as the channel before you. And it is of great passion for me to experience this and to cultivate relationships with these individuals, to share with them ideas. Doing this is one of my most exciting modes of expression. For I get to understand and explore your physical reality and your world and each of you very deeply. And I am also able to share information that is of service to your world. And all of you do that subtly for myself and my species. So this dimension of sharing, energy exchange, information exchange, and intimacy that is a part of these channeled experiences really are some of my favorite experiences. That's why I do it. 
I, not I, all I, members of my species do this. They have other passions. This is mine. I, I think it was not my of, only one, but it's a very large dimension of my passion. I, I think it was more referring to your homeworld, not just your species. Like I know uh, the physical planet as Sasani. Um, what, my what home world? Yeah. One of my favorite dimensions of it is exploring the oceans. Oh, well, yeah, that would explain, that would explain the inner, the inner exploring energy and everything because water is a physical, physical, physicalized form of energy to yeah. as a representation. So going deep into my planet's oceans is something that brings me a great deal of joy. Exploring some of the aquatic creatures that are there that are massive, massive in oh. size. Oh, what? So what are some, I, I, I heard about the little flat creature that acts as kind of like, not necessarily a pet, but a, a temporary companion. What are some other animals that are on your world that we haven't heard about yet? Well, I'll speak about a few of them. In particular, I'll speak about this aquatic environment since we're on that topic. There are certain creatures within our oceans that are similar to the whales that you have on your world, mm -hmm. but are exponentially larger. They are oh, massive cool. in size. Some of them, the size of what you would describe as football stadiums. Really? Some of yes, that's cool. that's cool. Yes, some of them the size as what you would describe as tall buildings, such cool. as in your cities. There are massive creatures in our oceans. This is something that has not necessarily been talked about at large, but it is a dimension about experience. They have skin, you could say, that is very slick. Some of them have skin qualities that are similar to how you would perceive a seal on your planet to feel if you were to touch it. Mm -hmm. Some of these creatures are scaled as well. Some of them, if you were to touch them, would almost feel like rock. They would almost feel like mountains. Oh, that's cool. Some of them are bioluminescent, such as what you have on your Earth. Others are not. Most of them communicate with sonic emanations like sonar, just as your dolphins do. Mm -hmm. However, their sonar is more amplified. Therefore, with their sonar, they can actually create physical effects through programming the water. Okay, cool. Different um, portals can be opened up through their sonic emanations as well to other realities. And sometimes we will work with these beings so they can co-create with us different portals that we then travel through that are very unique, that cannot be created on our planet's surface. Oh, wow. Um, so it, I know we have just a little while longer. Um, so if the dinosaurs hadn't died out like they did with the final nail with the comet and everything, and I know all the, I know the, if they had been continued, if they had continued to evolve on a version Earth where they were, they didn't die out or, what would they have evolved into as far as like, would they evolved into like more of a sentient species or would they have just stayed more animalistic? They would become more sentient. Yes, they would take on avian qualities. Many of them would develop feathers. Many of them would achieve flight. Many of them would change their morphology in a way that would allow for them to actually achieve flight. And it's likely they would have become the top species. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, did any of the, I know the avian dinosaur, the more raptor avian ones that we currently have? Did any of this, did any of those species actually continue on for quite some time after the destruction of like? Yes, yes, because many of them were brought off world. Okay. To explore life on other planets that are similar to Earth, but would allow for them to have different versions of evolution that were, in a sense, were curated to higher paths relevant to those oh. beings that were brought there, to those dinosaur saurian species. See, I never heard this before. This is new. Um, and what are just one or maybe one or two, other than like the marbles, the thuk, and a few other ones that Bashar, the Bashar has said, um, what are some other interesting alien species that are out there? All right, one moment. We have mentioned this species, and we'll mention it again. The Shamana is a particular species 
that we have made contact with. They are quasi physical in nature as we are. They are very planetary in relationship to how they experience their civilization, but they explore their planet as spirit beings. They are able to travel through the multidimensional portals that exist on their planet. They can access the Akashic level of their planet, the astral level of their planet with great ease. And they are able to, in a sense, blip in and out from their planetary experience in a way that allows for them to travel to other planetary realities, such as your own, that have different types of portals that are capable of supporting interplanetary teleportation. So these beings have teleported to your Earth before and have explored your Earth in many ways, and then they have been able to teleport back onto their world. It is quite interesting to observe these beings, for they have not required spacecraft to do their traveling. They specifically oh. use the planet. They is use that, the planet to access other planets. Is that what the burning bush was in the, um, the Bible, blah, 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 story of Moses? That's a little bit different. That will take a little bit more time to unpack in an in-depth way, but it's not exactly the same as the Shimano. Uh, is there any other race that you'd like to share besides that one specifically? Because I know we just one had- moment. The Dumak, this is another group we can talk about. Okay. Their world is more of a desert world. There are oceans on their world, there are islands, but a great deal of their world is in many ways sandy and is beach-like in nature. And this has to do with different types of, you could say, cataclysmic events that took place on this world before these beings inherited it. They are in many ways a species that has built a great deal of artificial, you could say, land masses on their oceans to accommodate their species for the desert worlds that are a part of their planet are not very hospitable. So they have built a great deal of, you could say, artificial dwellings on top of their oceans and deep within their oceans as well. So they are, in many ways, undersea beings, but they also do interact with the surface for these artificial islands that they have created also support life and also have many different types of functions, including residency. What do they look like? They are similar to you in appearance. They are humanoid in nature. They have much darker skin than many of you do. And this has to do with the intensity of their suns. How, how far away is their, um, their system away from ours? It's or not from... present in your, you could say, galactic expression. This is an extra dimensional type of reality okay. altogether. Um, how many... Um... How many civil, I know there's the O's that are in Sirius, but how many within like, about 50 light years of earth, are, how many civilizations do we have currently that are within our radius? There's a few within 50 light years, there's about six we can observe. Yeah. The idea is that not all of their worlds are detectable yet. And to truly perceive them, again, you must be in the proper vibrational frequency. Yeah. And the idea is when you're in the appropriate vibrational frequency, you will be able to perceive them and your technology simultaneously will be able to validate that. So it will all happen at once. Yeah. And I know, I know we're in a, a radio desert, a radio wave desert. That's why we're not getting like signals because most of the civilizations are no longer using that technology anyways. Um, Correct. Yes, yes. And most of them are quasi-physical. Most of them are extra-dimensional in nature. They're not as physicalized as you are. Therefore, their means of communication is different. It's not going to be the same as okay. two humans communicating. It will have qualities that involve what you describe as telepathy, such as what you're seeing yeah. before you here. Yeah, no, I, I, I kind of figured that was the case. I, I just, when you're always having other people ask questions, you don't always get like the questions you want asked. Um, and one last question, how will um, the fauna on Earth, the animals on Earth, change as 
we go forward as as a world well there's all types of different changes that we'll go through but in general you will find that their ability to communicate with all of you will increase now of course they do not communicate with words yeah they communicate with again telepathy yeah. and the idea is that as you continue to evolve yourselves you'll become more energetically sensitive to what they're communicating and you'll be able to have full-blown telepathic conversations with them oh and I... they will work with you on many levels both in the waking state and what you call the dream state as well and their intelligence their abilities will also grow and evolve as you all grow and evolve yourselves so you're evolving together in many ways and your relationship with the animal kind will be restored it will mirror how your ancient peoples related to the animals speaking my animal is like he's like completely attached to me um yeah no that's kind of what i thought like i i always tell everyone take me literal when i literal when i say this the world talks if you know how to listen exactly yes yeah. precisely it's just a matter of being more sensitive and the whole world will open up to you yeah. you'll understand many things that most people simply miss because as you've said they're not listening 